Hello everyone, I'm very happy to be on the Leachas channel here covering the women's candidates tournament which was uh, which has just concluded very recently and uh, yeah so a bit about the format of this tournament so basically we had two pools here this is the second pool, pool B um, pool A was won by Lei Tingjie and uh, now uh, we're going to see what happened in pool B so we have here um, uh, four players and they're going to play basically a, a four match uh, game a, a four game match <laughs> and uh, yeah so let's see how this first match between Alexandra Kostanyuk very famous player of course and Alexandra Goryakshina also a very famous player both uh, very well known in the chess world um, um, so yeah let's see how this first game proceeded so um, I'm just going to, uh, well this isn't really a spoiler, but <laughs> I'm just going to say here that actually this match, the, these four games, were all about exchanges. So correct exchanges and bad exchanges. So let's see exactly what I mean <laughs> as we delve into these games. So we have here uh, Kostani going for her standard e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, we have the Rui Lopez. And now knight f6 signaling the Berlin variation. But uh, Kostanyuk here is not interested in going for the endgame. She wants to fight a bit and goes for d3. A very enterprising line. Bishop c5 is standard move. And now this kind of exchange variation. Now do note here of course that the standard knight takes e5 is never working because of queen d4. Or bishop takes uh, f2 check followed by queen d4. In this case it's bishop takes f2 check. Um, actually no, it's queen d4 <laughs> Both work, I mean Okay, so um, Knight b2 here, of course Again, you don't capture the pawn, just standard development And here, let's start By uh, saying that This is the kind, these are the kinds of Exchanges I was talking about So here white gives up their bishop pair But they have damaged black's pawn structure Now I have always uh, I have always really liked black In these positions, to be honest because I don't really see how bad these pawns can be. Now, of course, um, correct play by white can really put black on the back foot. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. Of course, both sides are playable, obviously. And yeah, so here we have the first basic imbalance. So again, it's two bishops. And you have the pawn structure that's ruined for black. But they have the bishop pair. Okay, so let's go with uh, the game here. So knight d7 just protecting... Uh, the e5 pawn and this might seem a bit weird now of course uh, because you're completely hemming in this uh, light squared bishop but the light squared bishop doesn't really want to develop at this stage of the game because obviously on bishop g4 you just have h3 and it could get a bit annoying so uh, knight d7 is a perfectly fine and it's the main line theory here castles castles both sides castles and knight c4 is played here just getting uh, the knight out of uh, d2 so that the bishop can have some eyes here. And uh, yeah, and this, the knight c5 is obviously attacking this pawn, so the pawn is defended. And now Alexandra Kostanyi goes for a really weird move, king h1, a very rare move in this position. Now, the point here is just to get a game. Obviously, you're playing this, uh, this kind of position here. You're not going for some big theory like you don't want to completely dismantle your opponent out of the opening of course you're just going for some normal stuff trying to get a game get out of theory maybe and just play just play chess so king h1 is a very uh, a normal move in that regard also it has some ideas it's just it's not just this kind of uh, waiting move that's doing nothing actually the idea here is to um prepare a four at some point and this is going to be the main theme of the next few moves so white is going to try to play a four and black is going to try to prevent that now i have to mention here that there's this also weird queen e1 move the point is to further prepare before or prepare before immediately and um, yeah just get out of the way of the d1 square which could be available for a rook later on with potential d4s and uh, eyeing the black queen again queen e1 is similar to king h1 in that it's a move that um, that really this is modern chess guys so these kinds of moves they're not so incorrect that they can be punished 
and they're not even maybe so incorrect that they can even be punished by the best uh, like a perfect chess player like the perfect angel or something um, because chess has a lot of drawish tendencies so so these kinds of moves are becoming playable and they're just played so to get your opponent out of theory and out of book and create some kind of imbalance in the position get just get a game going which is getting more and more difficult um, but um, this is the beauty of adaptation this is the beauty of uh, all of this uh, evolution in chess and that these kinds of moves are becoming playable so chess is becoming richer and richer now we don't want to get into <laughs> Uh, this uh, kind of argument engines have their own chess yes or no <laughs> that's another topic for another day but yeah so queen e1 is a nice move in my opinion to do that bishop e3 is a standard move bishop d2 is also a standard move and a4 is a very also um, a very positional move in this regard because it's trying to go we are going trying to go for a5 uh, getting your uh, uh, queenside space there as white and potentially trying to trap the bishop also like with b4 of course it's never going to be trapped but um you never know <laughs> okay so rook e8 king h1 and now goryakshina goes for b6 which is actually a novelty um f6 and a5 again a5 gaining queenside space f6 further defending this uh, pawn and uh, creating strong uh, dark square uh, a strong dark square point um, both moves have been tried um, and are uh, normal moves. B6 is very logical as well. Um, you have ideas to Fienketo here and you also might want to just move the bishop out of the way and play C5, which is also a very normal uh, positional move. Trying to play C5 so that later, if the knight moves, for example, you can play C4, breaking, uh, uh, getting rid of your doubled pawns and later then playing also C5. And yeah, getting rid of your double pawns and trying to ruin white's pawn structure. So, um, white here goes for knight g1, a very weird move, but the point is clear. This has been made possible also by king h1, knight g1, the point is to go knight e2 and prepare a4. So again, all made possible by this very weird king h1 move. Jack follows suit and plays knight f8. Now that uh, uh, pawn doesn't need to be defended anymore. Knight of 8 is a very standard move, and the point is also to go knight g6 and prevent f4. So knight e2, knight g6, both sides going for the standard uh, maneuvers we've talked about. And now white goes for knight g3. No longer going for f4, because here f4 is a bit of a dubious move, because it would be premature. After takes, takes, we have the brilliant f5, and now you can see the point. Black has the bishop pair, so they need to open up the position. f5 does exactly that. And um, yeah, here white is, to be honest, on the back foot. Uh, probably black is maybe slightly better here, at least in practical terms, um, especially because they're losing the momentum. So now knight g3, bishop e6, and now we see knight e3. A very standard move, of course. Black developed the bishop, so you have to get the knight out of the way. You don't want to see um, these doubled pawns, potentially. And here the knight is going to further attack the f5 square, which is quite weak for black. So uh, black plays f6, standard move, just over protecting e5. And now knight g f5. Now perhaps here knight e f5 is a bit better, and we'll see why later on. Or even the standard positional move with a4, and later going for a5, again gaining queenside space. Knight fg5 was perhaps not as accurate because you're just blocking in this bishop while if you compare knight e f5 you have this bishop opened up so knight fg5 was played um i don't know what uh, why alexandra chose this knight and not the other but she did and here we see queen d7 and a standard move also of course over um of, of course just attacking the f5 square and developing and connecting the rooks Queen f3, again a standard move, you're getting the queen into the game, and you have these g4, g5, queen g3 ideas, for example, or even queen h3 ideas. King h8, getting out of the way and uh, preparing uh, some defense over uh, the g, uh, g7 square with rook g8, for example. Rook g1, again preparing this g4 move. Knight f4, standard, of course, so the 
Knight here is blocking in the bishop, so knight f4 can be played, you're improving your pieces. And you want to play g6 of course to um, dislodge this knight. And now white goes for g3, which is a bit of a mistake because of what we will see in the game. Um, the game proceeded knight h3, rook f1, and now knight g5, queen e2, and knight f7. And the knight is going to come to this square, and it's going to be quite annoying, especially with these ideas in mind, which actually did occur in the game. And here uh, black started getting an advantage. As we can see, g3 is already giving black a slight advantage. Now here let's see some moves. So let's see the point of um, this uh, um, this move. So bishop d2, so what's the point of knight f4? So if bishop d2 is standard looking move, you have g6. Again, something we talked about, we've talked about. So playing g6 to dislodge this knight from f5. Knight h4, and now bishop d4. And here if you play, for example, c3, you're just completely weakening this pawn and it will soon be lost. And this bishop is attacking this pawn, and if you move, for example, there's this. So it's a really big problem for white to deal with. So um, this is the point of knight f4. It's actually a very uh, missing move. However, you have this rook d1 move, which would have retained the balance. Because after bishop takes f5, for example, you have knight takes f5, knight e6, and the position is about, about equal. Now you can play c3, for example. The pawn isn't as weak, especially with the rook supporting it. And if, for example, g6 now, the move we've talked about before, now you don't have to move back, actually. You can even play d4. Thanks to the rook being here, d4 is made possible. And uh, yeah, you can see that if, for example, takes, you have taking the bishop. So rook d1 would have maintained the balance. Unfortunately for Kostanyuk, she didn't see this move and she played g3. Knight h3, rook f1, knight g5, uh, queen e2, knight f7. And now, who's doing better? Of course, it's black. Why? Of course, it's black, of course. <laughs> well, these squares, for example, are weak. You don't have a light squared bishop as white. Black has the bishop pair. This structure, while of course a bit weak, it's not becoming apparent how white can exploit this weakness. And the black knight is going to be entrenched on this d4 square. This d4 square belongs to black. And at any point c3 makes this d pawn quite weak. And you don't have the tactics we've had before with rook d1 because there's simply not enough firepower right now. Um, so black is doing better here. Here also a5 was an interesting alternative, just getting some queenside space. However, um, she goes for knight f7, b3, and now uh, knight d6. Um, now b3 of course is just trying to prevent any bishop takes a2s later on, and uh, trying also maybe to uh, protect uh, the a4 pawn, just normal, uh, a normal looking move. You don't have much else as white anyway, and potentially you have bishop b2 at some point, which was played in the game. Um, again, a5 was a possibility, but here uh, Goryakshina goes for the positional maneuver, knight d6. The knight goes back. You don't really want to take here, of course, and improve black's pawn structure. So knight b5 heading to d4, bishop b2. And now, remember what I said about exchanges? You don't go for knight d4 here, you go bishop d4. The point is that c3 is unplayable, and this means that what's forced is bishop takes d4, and after knight takes d4, queen d1, this knight is super annoying. Again, c3, you just really weaken uh, d, uh, d3, So, uh, but this was necessary, so after c5, c3, knight c6, and queen d2, now d3 is very weak. White has two knights against this knight and bishop combo and the bishop oh it's going to have a lot of fun now i have to mention that queen e2 perhaps wasn't the most of uh, most accurate move actually queen c2 was perhaps more accurate the point is a bit deep actually if we follow this line which uh, contains very standard looking moves the point here is that the queen on c2 is actually protecting b3 because if we go for this line with queen e2 also a5 was played in the game, f4, all of these moves are standard, you're attacking on the queen side, white is attacking on the king side, a4, and now here you see that if the queen were on c2, at least it's protecting b3. So uh, that's uh, that's why queen c2 is a bit better than queen e2. Now here, white should have played f5 and continued with uh, g5, perhaps g4, just trying to get some queen side, uh, king side counterplay. 
of course the queen side will be in shambles and maybe you should do something about this b3 pawn maybe taking or something but still it was way better than what they did what Kostanyuk did what she did with rook a b1 which is just a bit passive now after takes takes and rook d8 you're just defending as well at first you have to protect the spawn now you have to protect the spawn rook a3 you have to protect the pawn again so, so you see now it kind of looks illogical what uh, Kostanyuk did First she went queen e2, then she had to go queen c2. Now of course, foreseeing all of this requires uh, immense understanding. Um, uh, and that's why that's why people blunder. That's why people as strong as Kostanyuk blunder. Because chess is all about like this, this one square. <laughs> so it's, it's all about one square. Like queen c2 would have been much better than queen e2. How are you supposed to understand that? You have to calculate deeply and understand the position deeply. Okay, so b5 here. And now knight f3. Okay, so um, this move wasn't the most accurate because again f5 should have been played and just get some uh, control over uh, the the king side. And actually, we're going to see why this is very important to block in this queen. So we're going to see this actually in just a few moves. So knight f3 and now queen f7. Actually, here you could have already um, played uh, e takes f4. Because after g takes f4, there's this brilliant bishop f7, with the idea being bishop uh, h5, attacking the weakened dark uh, light squares on uh, the white king side. And yeah, this is going to be a problem for white. However, queen f7 was played, which is fine, not bad. And now knight d2, um, e takes f4, g takes f4, and now uh, Goryakshina blunders with f5 ceding equality to uh, the white side actually here Goryakshina was basically winning with queen h5 a very logical move because it's difficult to see how white is going to stop black threats the f4 pawn is weak the e2 square is very weak whereupon the d3 pawn might fall b3 is weak um, positional ideas like b4 by black can be played the point being that as the pawn moves to c4, let's say, then the d4 square becomes um, under white's con uh, black's control. And yeah, so the light squares are very weak. So here, for example, if you play rook e1, preventing queen e2, you have queen h3. And again, the very same ideas, bishop g4, bishop f3 check, um, b4 with the knight d4 idea. So all of these ideas become uh, apparent and black is basically winning here. Yes, it's that bad. The point is that white has no moves they're just stuck here and uh, and yeah it's it's quite difficult to find a move for white instead goryakshina played f5 which unfortunately loses because uh, what not loses, loses the advantage because of e takes f5 bishop takes f5 knight takes queen takes and now the brilliant knight e4 not being worried about losing the pawn because after queen g2 it's actually even white who stands a bit better because of these ideas so um a very nice positional sacrifice and knight takes e5 is of course in the air so here uh, Goryakshina had to go for knight e7 and after queen f4 protecting the pawn the, these uh, these trades occurred and now it's just four pawns against four pawns and they called it a day and went for a draw so a bit sad for Goryakshina she really outplayed Kostanyuk especially with this very brilliant bishop d4 move understanding the position very well um, uh, and Kostanyuk, to be fair, had the advantage at some point, especially here with knight ef5. White would have had a nice advantage with queen g4, h4 ideas, um, being able to push on the king side and get a small attack going. Um, but overall, uh, Kost uh, Goryakshina also reacted very well in the opening with this uh, weird king h1 move. She wasn't caught off guard and played this wonderful b6 idea. So overall, a very well played game, to be honest, by both players, and it draws a deserved result. Though Goryakshina was, of course, quite sad to um, to have missed this opportunity here. Okay, so first game's in the books. It's a draw. Let's go for the second game. So here, Goryakshina with the white pieces playing against Alexandra Kostenyuk with the black pieces. So um, actually, I'm just going to spoil the result here. Well, of course, it was spoiled <laughs> just as we entered the game. But I mean, I'm going to spoil the way the game <laughs> developed. It was quite boring. <laughs> no, chess is never boring, guys. 
uh, there's always this rich uh, idea uh, these rich ideas no no of course not uh, the the kind of uh, it's the kind of game where both sides play too perfectly <laughs> so that's what's boring what's uh, uh, what's more exciting is of course blunters right well at some point of course playing uh, a perfect game is of course uh, at many points exciting now i'm uh, I think I'm uh, being too philosophical in this uh, <laughs> in this presentation. So uh, anyway, let's go for um, the game. So this is a normal kind of uh, Rui Lopez uh, closed position um, where you just go for uh, these kinds of maneuvers, a4, just uh, getting uh, queen side space, bishop b7, developing this bishop to the very strong light squared diagonal because here you have d5 ideas which would liquidate and give black some sort of equality here of course you play d6 first uh, before you can play d5 you have to maneuver a bit at bishop d2 this is becoming a standard idea um, uh, the point is to really control this b4 square so b4 is played and now c3 now you can for example take on b4 rook b8 this is uh, a move that's been popular in several grandmaster games uh, especially Carlson's games and the World Championship, for example, against Nepo. So now takes, you have one pawn, but the pawn is not going to last for long because of bishop a8. b5 though, takes, takes, and now takes. So um, why did I say b5 though? Because now uh, white has the freer pieces, of course. So um, yeah, black has one back the pawn, but white still retains the standard uh, first move advantage uh, advantage <laughs> so uh, knight c3 here gaining a tempo the rook goes back knight d5 a standard move trying to win this bishop so black has to react by taking the knight but now comes e takes d5 so creating some sort of imba imbalance and after knight d4 takes takes now white has this very powerful pawn which is really stopping uh, which is really like uh, completely controlling the c6 square so this pawn is backward and weak and white has some potential for an advantage unfortunately Kostanyuk here blunders <laughs> well it's a dubious dubious move but it basically blunders away the advantage and after this the game really gets liquidated and that's for a draw very quickly so the point here is that queen c2 actually wastes a move so to understand why queen c2 wastes a move you have to see the game continuation which was bishop g5 and after bishop a5, actually let me not go forward uh, so much. So again, so bishop g5 was played after queen c2. However, after bishop c4, for example, and uh, to understand bishop c4, you have to see what happens after rook takes b2. Of course, this loses because, well, this is a loose piece, right? Defended once, attacked once. LPDO, loose pieces drop off. And you have a nice tactic here with rook takes a8, queen takes a8, and rook takes e7 winning the two bishops for a rook. That's a very, very good exchange, and white is completely winning here. So after bishop c4, bishop g5, the move that was played in the game, now you can actually go for b4. And here, um, because the queen is, isn't on c2, any capture will allow the queen to capture. Um, um, actually, no, the queen being on c2 doesn't matter for <laughs> playing b4. But I mean, you didn't waste time. So now, if you play b4, any bishop takes d2 is met by queen takes d2 and any rook takes b4 of course is met by bishop takes b4 <laughs> so um, uh, queen c2 is basically wasting time because after bishop g5 bishop c4 bishop takes d2 queen takes d2 here we have a similar position as in the previous example but we um, took took time here wasted time to play uh, this uh, queen c2 move which uh, really didn't help us so if you compare this position with here now it's white who was able to play before and this position white still hasn't played before so queen c2 basically loses a move again this is similar actually do you see the parallels here <laughs> queen c2 is similar to the first game where, uh, where kostanyuk actually missed playing uh, uh, queen c2 she went for queen c2 do you guys remember that so here is a very similar situation where queen c2 shouldn't have been played. In that game, in the first game, queen c2 should have been played. So quite funny. Uh, I feel like a bit of pareidolia, right? <laughs> that 
trying to find patterns when none are there. Okay, <laughs> so bishop c4 here. Um, was the better okay? Yeah, so queen c2 anyway in the game, bishop g5. And here, uh, Goryakshina didn't want to go for bishop c4, and she instead wa went for bishop a5, which is unfortunately not uh, the best move. I mean, it looks very logical, you're attacking this pawn. You might have c4, b4 ideas later on, bishop c4, c b4 ideas later on. But the problem is, the way um, Gostanik played here, this really refutes White's idea, and she played flawlessly here. Of course, you can never capture here, because this guy is weak. So bishop a4, queen f5, attacking the pawn here. Bishop c6 had to be played, and takes here. And this does look like a strong positional bind, but it turns out that it's nothing. These pawns do look menacing, but turns out they're not so menacing. Black played really well here, first protecting the pawn, which does seem kind of sad that this heavy piece is protecting this pawn, but it's necessary and it turns out white doesn't really have much. So let's proceed with the game. So I'm just going to flip through this to go through this really quickly because both sides didn't really have much and uh, a draw was agreed. Of course, white can try to maybe play on a bit, like with some well-timed g4 maybe, but it's too risky, especially for a classical game, especially at this stage of the tournament. And uh, Goryakshina was satisfied with the draw here. Um, so very good results for Kostanyuk so far. She escaped game one, kind of. Well, yeah, Goryakshina had the advantage for most of that game, to be honest. And in the second game, uh, Kostanyuk was able to defend very precisely, so that's always a psychological boost for the defending side, and a, well, not so great, uh, um, uh, not so great thing for uh, the the attacking side. So um, a bit of a morale shaker there. Okay, so let's go for the third game, and here you can already see the result. Goryakshina did win as black. So let's see how she was able to do that. So e4, e5, knight of 3, knight c6. We're going for the Italian here, no rule of path. And uh, here in the Italian, basically, what I can say about this opening is that every single nuance and subtlety <laughs> exists, in, exists in this opening. You have like, when should you play d6 as black? When should you play h6 as black? When should you play a6 as black? When should you play a5 as black? And it all depends on when white plays a3, when white plays uh, h3, <laughs> when white plays d3 and c3 and uh, c3 and d4 and all of that. So a very nuanced opening. I'm not going to claim I have super GM understanding of this opening, uh, <laughs> like all of these fine nuances and subtleties. But what I can tell you is basically that after knight a4, which should be 6, here, uh, uh, Kostanyuk went for a3. What I can tell you is that knight takes b6 is playable and a3 is playable. But um, yeah, um, I think here it's more, it's not about nuances as much, it's more about picking a line. Um, so, um, so yeah, a3 is completely normal here. So, uh, Kostanyuk's strategy actually in this game was to delay the capture on b6 as long as possible. And this is the more common theoretical way to approach the Italian nowadays. Um, some strong players have tried taking on b6 before committing to anything. But nowadays, more and more, it's becoming popular to uh, just uh, delay the, kick, the capture on b6. So, bishop e6, bishop takes e6, f takes e6, castles castles and now again it's all about exchanges right so black has exchanged this light squared bishop which uh, should be good for black because this is the very powerful italian bishop and they get the f file to boot but of course white has a very strong center central play and they can play for a bishop versus knight advantage by taking um, this bishop at any point so both sides of course have their advantages but obviously the first move advantage has not been ruined for white, so white retains a slight pull here. Okay, so b4 gaining queenside space. Queen a8 trying to maneuver to the queenside. Uh, king side. I keep making this mistake. Um, c3. And um, yeah, just solidifying the position here, trying to go for d4. King h8 getting out of the way of 
some long diagonal ideas and potentially preparing rook e8, g5, g4 ideas. And now rook a2 by Kostanyuk, which is actually a move that was played by Abdus Saturov against uh, Nihal Saren in uh, the very famous Olympiad game they've played in 2022. Um, uh, and not this exact position, I think it was a move later or a move before, but the very it's a very similar idea in the Italian. So rook a2 is a very nice move. The point is to go rook d2 and prepare d4, and also to overprotect the f2 square because you have these two menacing uh, pieces attacking f2. So rook a2 is a very nice positional idea, a very nice positional rook lift. Queen f7 here, protecting the e6 square and adding pressure along the f file. Rook e1, and now rook a d8. So um, I have to note here that uh, rook e1 is a standard move, of course, just uh, over protecting, uh, protecting e4 so that d4 becomes a possibility. And that's why rook a2 is nice, so that you're protecting f2 because the rook has to move from f1 to e1. But I have to note here um, that uh, white is also playing a kind of waiting game. We'll see why after rook a d8. All right, so which was played in the game, and now white went for the correct knight takes b6, a takes b, a takes b6, and a4. So this is actually the point of uh, this waiting game. White doesn't really want to see, knight, after knight e7 for example, white doesn't really want to play takes takes a4, because then a5 loses in strength, because the rook is on a, a8, where it's uh, x-raying this unprotected a2 rook. Seems a bit um, incomprehensible now, but you'll understand exactly what I mean in just a few uh, moves. So rook a d8 was perhaps a bit of an inaccuracy by uh, a dubious move by uh, Goryakshina. Um, perhaps he should have played knight e7 and went for knight g6 and still maintained this rook on the a5. Going rook a d8 makes sense because you're trying to prepare d5 yourself, but now white comes in with their idea, which is, I think, more powerful. So a4, knight e7, and now a5. And had the rook been here, it would have been a bit of a different story. Because you can't really take, because the a2 rook would have been hanging. So now Goryakshina corrects her mistake, rectifies her error, and goes for rook a8, which is smart. You have to, this is the beauty of chess, you have to admit your mistakes. And sometimes when you admit your mistakes, you can even win a game, like Goryakshina did. Um, not admitting it, admit it to your mistake can't keeping uh, um, and uh, insisting on going for your agenda with uh, d5, for example, in this position, that would have been just wrong. So um, queen b3 here was played, and uh, yeah, just connecting the rooks eventually with bishop a e3 and rook a1, uh, rook, f a, uh, rook e a1, so a standard idea, queen b3, and also um, eyeing some squares on the queen side, attacking e6, for example, and uh, yeah, potentially after takes takes, you have queen takes b7. So I have some squares on the queen side. So b takes a5, and now rook ta takes a5. Uh, I've labeled this as a, a brilliant, well, not a brilliant move, as a good move, because if you you play bishop uh, b takes a5 here, knight c6, you take queen d7. Now the queen is starting to get stuck, so you have to move back. And after rook takes a5, takes takes. This position is really dry and about equal. Rook takes a5, however, keeps more tension in the position, and now it's um, white who can try to play for a win, which is what uh, Kostanyuk really needs, because this is her last white game before she has to play black in the fourth game, and if they keep drawing, well, that would uh, require a tiebreaker, a, a rapid tiebreaker. So here go reaction one and well we haven't spoiled the fourth game result yet so let's see what happened here um so rook takes a5 knight g6 and now d4 um a bit premature bishop e3 and maintaining the position maybe and later playing d4 perhaps this was better d4 is a bit premature because after e takes d4 c takes d4 there comes d5 and this is a very standard idea and these kinds of positions, just getting uh, allowing your knight to go to this e4 square, and for example, if e5, and if takes, takes, you have um, um, so like uh, the chess uh, kind of um, 
the deep chess point here after takes takes is that white black should equalize because then you have d4 against d5 while here you have d4 e4 against d5 e6 so this e4 pawn is more advanced it's in the center more so it should be stronger than the e6 pawn so um the deep chess point here is that after takes takes you've equalized basically as black and if you play e5 you allow knight e4 and there's a lot of pressure on the f file so it's also problematic so here white should uh, black should equalize um instead she went for knight d7 which is perhaps not as accurate as e takes d4 and here the game proceeded normally bishop e3 developing b6 getting rid of this rook on a5 and now capturing twice get the knight goes back to f6 where it attacks e4 queen c2 protects and now knight h5 trying to go for these kinds of ideas where the knights are swarming in and uh, yeah white is going to have a tough time here um, because the knights are going to be very very powerful um all right just a second okay so rook c1 here was played which is the final well not the final inaccuracy but it's one big inaccuracy not a big inaccuracy <laughs> but it's actually not as accurate as rook a1 because this would have kept the winning chances alive now white has e5 ideas b5 ideas rook c7 ideas where after rook takes c7 for example if the rook is on c1 you have to play queen takes c7 but if the rook is on a7 you can play rook takes c7 at gaining a tempo on the black queen and uh, yeah so this is the idea here now to understand why rook a1 is stronger than the game continuation let's take a look at this sample line so knight f4 here standard move knight e1 you have to protect the square and you also have to avoid because here the threat is knight takes g2 or even knight takes h3 check where after g takes h3 you have queen takes f3 so you play knight e1 protecting the g2 square and now after d5 e5 knight h4 further attacking this h4 square and queen g6 ideas are in the air so you have to play king h2 trying to play g3 and uh, avoiding uh, any queen g6 shenanigans in the long term knight gf6 and here you can see for example that after some moves like rook a1 rook c7 um, white is a bit better actually quite a bit better um, um, also note that queen h5 for example trying to get an attack going just allows bishop takes f4 um, uh, actually and this is yeah now i remembered this is the main point of uh, that's why rook a1 is so much better than rook c1 <laughs> because this is uh, possible because the rook is on a1 if the rook takes by the way obviously rook a1 just leads to mate you block twice and it's mate thanks to this queen blocking this king so king h8 turns out to be a wrong move because you know it allows mate 20 moves later no, of course i'm kidding <laughs> But imagine if that were the case chess is very deep guys chess is very deep so but, but actually this line shows the deep point that rook a1 after this sequence of semi-forced moves basically with the knights going here and all of these are very logical and basically forced moves now the point is that queen h5 doesn't work because of bishop takes f4 and if queen h5 doesn't work you have to go back with the knight then white is doing quite well instead in the game after rook c1 knight h Four, knight e1 e5 and king h2 um, uh, yeah this wouldn't have been as good um, with rook c1 because now after e5 which should have been played by the way um, here uh, Kostanik played king h2 which allowed equality after takes queen takes and knight d5 and we'll see the game continuation in a second but let's go for the line we were looking at so e5 and now after knight h4 which we've looked at and king h2 which we've also looked at now comes queen h5 and this is working now and there are some threats here like knight takes and queen takes h3 and bishop takes f4 is no longer possible well it is possible but after rook takes f4 you're not doing much while with the rook on a1 you had the mate threat um so this is the deep point behind rook c1 now if instead um knight h4 um no actually what happens after knight h4 here you have to play b5 gaining space on the king side and um, on the queen side <laughs> and uh, yeah just getting some uh, some free play here and stopping b5 by black and getting some queen side uh, space um actually so 
actually, uh, I just have to mention though, King h2 isn't the wrong move, but after Queen h5, Black is still in the game. So both b5 and Queen h2 are good moves. And by the way, let's take a look at what happens after Queen b2, which would be wrong. Now there's this Queen g6 idea we've been talking about, so that's what Black was threatening. So Knight f takes g2, takes, and Queen g6. And here you have to go for f4, and after Queen g3, and this, you have a basic, uh, basic equality. Um, black uh, is down a piece, but they have a lot of counterplay, and this should go. This should head towards the draw. Toward the draw. So queen b2. Um, so yeah, e5 should have been played instead. King h2, which just allows d takes e4. A bad positional idea, allowing this and knight d5. So the knight on the d5 square, killer. And actually, here the knight on d5 is so powerful powerful and the bishop on e3 is so potentially problematic because of these pawns on the dark squares that um, yeah you're really risking getting into a good knight versus bad bishop scenario which is actually exactly what occurred in the game so here Kostanyuk should have uh, sensed the danger and just went for rook c6 after knight g7 there's this funny um, draw, draw line with this repetition no good way to avoid it um, uh, you just are forced to go to f5 to protect the rook, and the knight just keeps dancing back and forth. Um, uh, so Kostanik should have played rook c6 here, attacking e6, and knight e g7 would have been forced. Uh, knight, uh, yeah, g7 would have been forced here, and yeah, this would have uh, allowed the draw. Instead, she played knight d3, not really sensing the danger, and now Kostanik um, Koryakshina starts a series of brilliant exchanges trading queens, so Goryakshina foresees that this knight versus bishop endgame is very good for uh, um, black, so she starts preparing some uh, trades, so here uh, white went for uh, rook c6, g3 was interesting to prevent b, um, to prevent f4 so she went for rook c6 attacking the knight on g6 so it was defended now perhaps there was an, an argument not to trade rooks here but uh, Goryakshina sees that the, the endgame without rooks is even better. Perhaps, perhaps not. Now here white of course could have also avoided the trade by uh, rook c4. And after for example f4 just go for bishop c1. And here with the rooks on board, it's always like, you know, there's this famous quote, rook end, all rook endgames are drawn. It's not quite true of course. But I mean rook endgames do always offer more chances for a draw. So here... Um, yeah, that's what uh, Goryakshina should have, uh, um, what Kostanyuk should have played. And here, of course, if rook c2 as well, same idea for bishop c1. So it depends what you want to pick. So both rook c2 and rook c4 were possible. However, Kostanyuk sees that this endgame is perhaps more, um, it's easier to draw, but yeah, I kind of disagree. I like keeping the rooks on the board. And uh, yeah, here um, uh, Goryakshina starts with... Uh, the standard plan of just getting the uh, rook, uh, the rook, the king into the game. The standard endgame plan, and now Kostanyu goes for a nice exchange. Actually, now it it does like you guys remember. I'm telling you that you don't you want to avoid this good knight versus bad bishop endgame. So why is Kostanyu willingly going into it? Now here because the e5 pawn gets improved. Uh, the d4 pawn be becomes an e5 pawn, which is much improved. So as, um, uh, because after king f7, like the king can't go here, of course, so you just pick up the knight. So you have to take as black. And after e takes, uh, d takes e5, you have a passed pawn, which is also protected. So um, that means uh, that's quite good for white. Or at least an improvement over having the pawn on d4, where it can become very weak and uh, a target for attack. Especially with, again this uh, situation going on here so um, um 95 check was actually quite a brilliant idea quite a smart exchange quite a smart exchange here peace exchange very smart here okay 95 takes 95 so standard plan here the king inches closer and now Kostanyuk blunders with bishop e1 which actually just loses the game believe it or not her final try here for equality actually here actually white has a way to draw the game with the brilliant king g3 the point of king g3 even though it seems completely stupid right 
because you're ceding control of the four square and you're just allowing the black king to have fun on the queen side and promote the pawns. But the point here is that you're going to take at some point and you yourself are going to um, uh, create counterplay on the king side. And actually the counterplay is sufficient with the bishop because there are pawns on both sides of the board. So that's where the bishop is usually stronger than the knight. Of course, it's not enough to have any sort of advantage. Don't dream of that as white. But here it's enough to save the draw. So let's say um, black goes for king c5 here. You take, allowing knight takes a 5 check, which does seem a bit counterintuitive. But we'll see why in, the, in a second. And if uh, g takes a 5, of course, king h4 and you're getting in. And uh, here white uh, should be completely fine. Now if knight takes a 5 check, king g4. Now the point is to go h4, h5 and undermine this knight. So um, uh, uh, black... Uh, improves the position of their uh, of their king and gets the bishop to a worse square worse than d2 now it only has one potential diagonal well it does have two but like <laughs> it's uh, weaker than being on d2 and um, where it doesn't protect before and now you play h4 again you don't care about this the bishop can do a good job in stopping the queen side pawns and you're going to try to liquidate uh, on the king side and try to get your own passed pawn so that's how you draw but now Black plays knight g7, and the point here is that you're preventing both h5 because, um, uh, I mean, you can just take with check, of course, and the knight is protecting, and f5 is the same idea. But actually, we'll see um, that the that the pawn is still going to be sacrificed. So after bishop d2, b5, f5, the pawn gets sacrificed. G takes f5, king f4, king d4, and bishop e3. And the problem is that the knight can't move. And uh, you have complete control here over these uh, two pawns on the queen side. So this should end in a draw. So the last chance was king g3. Unfortunately for uh, Kostenyuk here, she missed that with bishop e1. And now after knight c6, g takes f5, g takes f5. We can also see here that uh, king g3 just allows knight d4. So now king g3 is no longer the saving grace because if you try to take on a 5 and after g takes a 5 you don't have king h4 because knight f3 would be check and it would fork the bishop on e1 and the king on uh, and the king on h4 so watch out for that so uh, yeah so it's <laughs> it's really just as a one game move just putting your bishop on e1 allows some crazy fork that stops the drawing mechanism crazy so g takes a 5 g takes a 5 king e3 and here the knight is just getting in, the king is getting in. There is really no counterplay for white. She does try a very nice idea here with bishop a5. The point being after b takes a5, white would actually be winning. Because after b6, knight d8, e6. And you can see that these kinds of two passed pawns, too good for the knight. The knight can't stop them and b7 would just get the queen. Goryakshin though doesn't uh, falter here and plays king c4. Bishop takes b6 and here and yeah the pawns are just falling and the game will soon end in a black victory and what a black victory so again very unfortunate for Kostanyuk um, she did find some very nice moves in previous games but uh, in this game she was not uh, able to defend at the very last second and uh, yeah the game was decided in Goryakshina's favor so now let's see was Kostanyuk able to come back and win the fourth game? We're going to see... And the answer is no. <laughs> but take a look at what the game it was. Take a look at what the game it was. Because Kostanyuk really put on like everything she had here to be able to uh, win the... Or try to win the game. So um, let's begin. D4, G6. Already a signal of imbalances galore e4 bishop g7 c4 d6 so we're going for a king's indian kind of setup knight c3 knight d7 but not exactly the king's indian because the knight isn't on f6 so it's more of a modern setup a modern opening so bishop e3 knight g f6 f3 and now we transpose into the king's indian sameish variation and now a6 what a weird move the point is really just to get out of theory and perhaps play rook b8 c5 or rook b8 b5 
or b5 and c5 if white allows it so this is the kind of little queenside move that actually has a lot of potency so white should be careful so bishop d3 rook b8 and now knight g2 of course b5 here would be premature but here uh, Goriak uh, Kostanyuk actually goes for c6 insisting on playing b5 however c5 would have already been a good move and actually um, completely fine for black like this position is of course b better for white by quite a bit because of this brilliant uh, pawn center but uh, white is definitely uh, like black definitely has winning chances here however um, she went for c6 but now Goryakshin has brilliant move a4 stops all kinds of hopes of b5 so this really does play against uh, black's uh, black's plan so castles a5 again very natural trying to prevent b5 because now a takes b6 will completely ruin black's pawn structure on the king uh, queen side but b5 is forced by uh, for black because they don't have anything better than to allow that um, um, queen side uh, pawn destruction now i have to say that perhaps a5 wasn't uh, completely necessary perhaps castling was even better but a5 also makes logical sense um, so takes takes and now queen takes and now you can see that there is some activity for black so white needs to be careful knight a4 queen c7 and uh, just kicking the queen out queen c7 castles and now e5 a highly questionable move much more natural was c5 where you just open up for the bishop i don't really understand why e5 was played though it does make sense because after closing the position you do get strong uh, control over the d4 square but it's it's yeah it's not good d5 closes the position and remember all go reaction needs is a draw all go reaction needs is a draw and this becomes an important theme in this game so knight h5 queen c2 knight h5 is a very standard idea the point is to prepare a5 and create kingside counterplay because your opponents uh, your pieces are uh, your pawns are um, pointing toward this direction so white's play is on the queen side while black's play is on the king side because the, because the pawns are pointing in this direction so this is actually a very standard way to know how to attack which side to attack in closed positions all right so uh, queen c2 and now king h8 okay so king h8 yeah just getting out of this long diagonal now of course it's not the technically best move actually c takes d5 would have been the, the objectively best move because after c takes d5 queen takes c2 bishop takes c2 knight f4 black should be doing uh, fine here with the knight coming to f4 the problem is this is an end game with no real winning chances for black it's actually not an end game of course it's a queenless middle game but i mean black doesn't have a lot of winning chances here so um uh, remember the game result uh, the previous game result so kostanik has to win so she went for here um king h8 which is the good practical decision because she has to win she can't allow that end game fc1 f5 and now e takes f5 by goriakshina actually the more accurate move would have been d takes c6 the point here is that for example after f takes e4 of course this doesn't work because takes takes and you have a new queen on the board so white would win a piece here in this line after recaptures recaptures and if d takes c6 knight df6 now you have takes 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 and white here is doing much better this does look a bit sc scary this uh, kind of alignment issue but um, queen, queen e6 can always be played attacking d6 which is a weak pawn because now rook d1 can also be played black doesn't really have any kingside counterplay and this bishop looks ridiculous while white's pawn on c4 looks quite powerful and this pawn is also weak and uh, yeah white's queenside play is going to be strong so white is doing much better here however uh, go reaction went for e takes f5 which is a slight slightly dubious move compared to d takes c6 and here um, Kostanyuk goes for g takes f5 now the powerful move here was actually c takes d5 the problem is though after c takes d5 you kind of have to play queen takes c2 and again allow this end game but uh, hey maybe your opponent goes wrong and i mean of course you don't really you aren't completely forced to play queen uh, c2 so here you might try something else but um 
I mean, you're kind of far, but yeah, I mean, c takes d5 is just too good because um, after f takes g6, you have this brilliant e4 move. So maybe your opponent might be uh, might blunder that. The problem is like if you don't play c takes d5, you go for the game continuation of g takes f5. You're also of course not going to win this game. So yeah, I don't know. Tough decision here, but maybe she should have played c takes d5. Again, I want to show this point after f takes g6, the greedy f takes g6, you have this brilliant e4 move. After the logical takes, 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 there's this very powerful move. And now there are a lot of threats actually. Bishop d4 here and even the weakening h3 move would both retain the balance for white and actually give white a slight advantage. The problem is after knight e5, g takes f, uh, the problem for white is if they, if they are super greedy and take on h7. Now comes nastiness. Knight g4. Hello, you're attacking this bishop. Where can it move to? I guess to d4. Okay. But now after takes takes d5 and h2 is uh, so let's take a look at this again. Bishop e4, d5 and yeah, all of this fourth sequence leads to a win for black. So be careful of being too much of a pawn grubber. <laughs> So uh, unfortunately though she didn't go for this and well probably good reaction wouldn't, wouldn't have played f takes g6 anyway But yeah she went for g takes f5, bishop takes f5, knight df6, my bad, knight df6, bishop takes c8, rook f takes c8, queen d2 and now rook b3 Which is again slightly inaccurate, actually this is a, a big uh, mistake because e4 would have kept uh, some chances for black to uh, play for an advantage here so f4 and knight g4 for example now you have knight a c3 the best move and after taking taking rook takes b2 or even a5 to protect the a6 pawn or rook takes b2 not caring about rook takes a6 here black can play on the queens are still on the board there's some imbalance here yes white is up a pawn but uh, yeah there's an imbalance here so uh, this is completely fine and after e4 f4 knight g4 bishop d4 for example a natural looking move would allow e3 a brilliant move the point is after for example bishop takes e3 there's this rook e8 move and there is a lot of pressure along the e file and this bishop is very nasty and these knights are very nasty attacking the black king and if e3 queen c3 now comes rook g8 and uh, there is this queen of seven c5 queen of seven c5 ideas and black is going to start to uh, start counterplay on the queen uh, on the king side and it's going to get nasty potentially um so e4 would have kept attacking chances for black and would have kept black in the game instead rook b3 allows knight a c3 which kind of forces the coming sequence which basically just allows white to liquidate and end up in a drawn position which is match over for kostaniuk um, here actually white could have played for an advantage with rook c3 Of course you don't want to trade that would just help white and if you go rook b4 there's this brilliant c5 move Completely opening up the position takes is met by d6 um, um, Taking here is obviously met by taking so it just completely opens up the position and it's a typical idea When you have these guys this kind of structure to just blast open the position with the c5 move um, Instead she went for knight a c3 the more Positionally sound move. The point here is just to defend and after taking taking this forced sequence Allows a basic draw with rook d1 um, Or a drawish position So again, let's take a look here take take it takes takes it looks like you're losing a piece But you get it back and now rook d1 The point here is that now rook takes b2 is forced and after taking 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 here um, um of course you can't take on e2 because of rook check so this is the tactic tactical point and now king g8 king f1 and this is just three pawns against three pawns this pawn is weak the rook is active um there is the there are these possibilities so it's even white who still stands a bit better and this is exactly what gory action wants because she wants a draw to win the match knight c3 would have been a way to play for the advantage but of course gory action isn't interested in keeping the queens on the board so rook, C1, rook d1 came as a saving grace there so rook d1 again we see this line so i can show it to you one more time 
attacking a form, rook a2, attack, uh, defending a6, g4, getting the knight out, knight f6, and now knight g3, improving the knight's position, the king gets into the game, but after g5, white is gaining space, rook b6, and now bishop f8, and this basically allows white to again press, rook takes h2 would have been better, because after rook b7 check, king g8, rook b8, king f7, rook b7 check, king g8, um, uh, this, uh, would have been a draw. Actually, no, what am I saying? <laughs> Rook takes h2 would have also allowed a draw, but it would have been better, like, objectively speaking. But, yeah, I mean, this position, white is just... White can force a draw whenever they want. They're much better. Um, well, much better uh, in at least the practical sense. So, yeah, Kostanyuk has no way to win this position anymore. But Rook takes h2 would have been the more objectively better move because after of uh, also by the way just to mention rook b7 you can't avoid the draw with king f8 because of bishop c5 check and here you're going to lose something <laughs> after knight f5 of course and all of that so bishop f8 was played but still that doesn't uh, help much because now comes rook b7 check and i annotated this as a brilliant move even though it loses the advantage because h4 would have been the last try for white to play for an, an for an advantage and try to win the game but of course Goryakshina who cares about winning the game she wants to qualify for the candidates so she plays rook b7 check forcing a draw because now after king g8 rook b8 you have to go back because at any point trying to block with bishop e7 just allows again bishop c5 so what a brilliant game by Goryakshina she completely killed the uh, black's counterplay here and perhaps black had some more chances but yeah just wasn't enough so a brilliant game by goryakshina and a very well deserved victory here um over kostanyuk her esteemed opponent so the young guns um uh, again prevailing against uh, the old guard um so actually i know this is a game analysis video but i thought i would include some puzzles here um uh, because i thought um yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I thought it would be nice here to finish off what we've uh, learned, to kind of try to remember what we've learned. Again, remember the theme today was all about exchanges, so exchanging all of your pieces and all of that. Um, good exchanges, bad exchanges, remember the games with the... Um, uh, uh, with the <laughs> with the minor pieces minor piece exchanges so very important to learn that so let's go for some puzzles right all right so we have one puzzle from each game so let's take a look at these puzzles so uh, yeah try to remember uh, what occurred and uh, try to remember the themes so here you can see that all of these pieces are really not defending the white king right so boom you come in with the queen and start an attack. Now this rook prevented us from coming to e2, but hey, we have this square, whereupon we can play for these kinds of ideas. b4 is an idea, again with knight d4, weakening the structure, and some good things are going to happen. Okay, so here in this position, so this bishop is uh, kind of allowing some tactical ideas with rook takes a1, right? Do you remember that? And uh, it's a bit of a bad bishop, right? I mean, it doesn't have many prospects, so we try to trade it off. That's a very important idea. Also, very common in the Czech Benoni opening, bishop g5. Ah, uh, this, trying to draw here. Definitely not bishop e1, which would allow all of this stuff, right? <laughs> so you go king g3, trying to go for quick kingside uh, counterplay with the pawns. The king comes in, but now you take, allowing knight takes f5, but you have king g4. The king attacks the bishop, you have to move back. You don't care about the b4 pawn because you have counterplay on the king side. You push through with h4, your plan, and uh, now you try to protect uh, b, uh, b4. And of course, any king d3 will be met by bishop c1, any king c4 but by bishop d2, so that would be a draw. So black tries to play b5, but now you can sacrifice here and play king f5, and now the position is difficult to crack for black. And here, you remember this position, you play c takes d5, and if white is too greedy, you have this nice trick, and after takes takes, you're going to play knight e5, improving the position of the knight, getting the bishop out, and if white is super greedy, well, they're going to lose. And now d5 is a double attack. So hope these puzzles really summed up the game as well. 
Um, so uh, I really liked this match. Very enterprising match. Very back and forth. Goryakshina put on a very nice show. But Kastanyuk, wow, she defended so well. But unfortunately, she cracked at, at the end. Couldn't sustain all of that defense. And the Goryakshina was the well deserved winner. So congrats to Goryakshina. And we're going to see who she's going to play in the uh, final of Pool B. And uh, of course, before that, we're going to analyze the games between uh, the players who are playing in the second uh, match of Pool B. So with that, thanks for watching guys, and remember to always check out Leechas, donate to Leechas, and uh, support Leechas as much as you can, the free, adless, and open source chess server. Open source is a great thing, it's a great gift to humanity. Alright guys, thank you very much for watching, take care.